And it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Rico Damon Short. I've been trying to get him on the show since day one. He attended the Medical College of Georgia School of Dentistry to attain a Doctor of Dental Medicine degree in 99. In 2002, he earned his postdoctor degree in endodontics from Nova Southeastern University. He added the final notch to his belt and became a diplomat of the American Board of Endodontics in 2009. His private practice, Apex Endodontics, was opened in 2004 and is located in Simmer, Georgia, just outside Atlanta. Dr. Short has almost 20 years of experience in dentistry and over 15 years in endodontics. He is an expert consultant in endodontics to the Georgia Board of Dentistry and an assistant clinical professor at the Dental College of Georgia and Augusta. He is an independent national lecturer and is endorsed by the American Association of Endodontist Speakers Bureau. In addition, he has treated numerous celebrities from actors, producers, writers, comedians, television anchors, sports athletes, and music artists. He is affectionately known as the root canal specialist to the stars. Dr. Short has written articles and published in several journals, including Dentistry of Today, he made the exclusive cover April 2013, Inside Dentistry, Upscale Magazine, Rolling Out Magazine, and the Journal of Endodontics. He has lectured at the American Dental Association and the National Dental Association annual meetings, in addition throughout the United States and the Caribbean. Dr. Short's work has been published in dental journals around the world with opportunities to speak in China and the Philippines. Furthermore, Dr. Short has a very robust online presence in dentistry. He has over 3,000 followers on LinkedIn worldwide and over 10,000 followers on Facebook explaining various dental procedures and current trends in dentistry. Dr. Short was named one of the top 40 dentists under 40 in America by Incisal Edge Magazine in 2013 and has been named in Dentistry Today consistently as one of the top leaders in continuing education. He is a frequent contributor to online dental journals as well. In addition, he has made several guest appearances on local and national radio, television stations. In June 2012, he spoke at Trinity Broadcast Networks to over 80 million households worldwide, dispelling myths about root canal therapy and optimizing oral health. Dr. Short has received several prestigious awards and accolades throughout his career. He is very philanthropic in his community. Dr. Short has established an annual scholarship at the Dental College of Georgia in Augusta, formerly known as the Medical College of Georgia School of Dentistry. He is an American Dental Association success speaker and graduate of the Institute of Diversity and Leadership Program. With his knowledge, Dr. Short travels around the country speaking to senior dental students about the future of dentistry. In addition, he volunteers at various nonprofit organizations and charity events. In October 2012, Dr. Short was selected as a panelist for the Affordable Care Act. He was invited to the White House to give his personal opinion about how the Affordable Care Act would affect both businesses and citizens of our country from a health care provider perspective. Dr. Short is also a motivational speaker and author. His new book entitled Getting to the Root of Your Problem, 365 Days of Inspirational Thinking is considered one of the most thought-provoking self-published books to date. And by the way, my oldest sister is a Catholic nun and she loves the book. He travels <laughs> abroad teaching people to tap into their God-given potential to make a positive difference in society. Dr. Short is married to Angela Short, who is a dental hygienist. They have two children, Jayla and Ava. Gosh darn, what a resume, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm such a big fan of yours. Uh, those cases you post on LinkedIn, I almost wonder, does he ever get an initial root canal where it's just a simple molar root canal? They're always these heroic, herodontics. That will call you Rico Herodontics Short. They're, they're just some of the most amazing retreats I've ever seen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I tell everybody before I go in, I go into a phone booth like Clark Kent and I turn to Superman. I have a cape, put my cape on, the S on my back, and then we go to work. So uh, I'm known as the guy to be able to save teeth that other people can't save. So um, at first it was very difficult and I'm like, God, why are you doing this to me? But I realized in the end that, you know, as you get the tough cases, you become an expert, you become a master at those. So when you get the easy cases, you know, it's kind of like, you know, this is a straightforward molar. And you learn to appreciate those. But like anything else, you know, the more you do something, the better you're going to get get at it. And, um, you know, and it's always work to be done. It's work to be improved on. So I enjoy doing it. Well, what do you think of endodontists now starting to place implants? Do you think it's going to make them look at some of these very difficult retreats and say, it take me three hours to retreat this, but I could pull it and place an implant in an hour? Well, actually, that's a good point. Um, we actually... 
was in the dawn of that back in 2008 when the economy kind of crashed. I was actually in an Indo meeting in Dallas and I pulled up and I saw a big sign that said Nobel BioCare. And I'm like, what the hell is this? Where am I? We're carrying bags with Nobel BioCare. Well, they were saying at the time, since people aren't spending the money getting root canals, endodontists must get into implants or else your practice is doomed. I was going to practice management seminars, and that's what some of the gurus were saying. I say, Dr. Shore, I know you're good in doing endo, but if you don't get any implants, you're not going to survive two to three years. And I was kind of bummed out about it. I'm like, I busted my butt learning what I learned and doing what I do. And I just say, you know what? I don't agree with that. I think people are going to always want to save their teeth. We are in a recession now. I think we'll come back. And there are a lot of endodontists that invested a lot of time, money, resource into the equipment. But guess what? Now the pendulum is swinging. We're seeing that periodontists and oral surgeons are saying, hey, you know what? Long term, this implant is not what we thought. We want to save the natural too. So now the pendulum is switched, swinging back. And now there are endodontists that got piles and piles of implant stuff in their office. And guess what? They're not using it. So now the pendulum is swinging back into saving teeth. So um, it's glad, you know, I, I've been around dentistry a while. I know you have too. You probably remember when they had silver points and we thought that was the best thing since sliced bread. And now guess what? We're going back to gutter percha, what we were using since 1922. So, um, you know, um, I, I do think implants have a place in dentistry, but we're seeing the pendulum starting to swing back to keeping the natural tooth. Ryan, you know what we have to do this weekend? It'll be a, a birthday, Christmas present, all wrapped up in one for Um, You know, at the end of the Brad Gettleman yes. podcast with that video. So, you know, you know um, Ben Johnson, um, the founder of, of uh, Tulsa Dental Products in Tulsa, Oklahoma, he actually, somebody sold him the oldest video of a root canal being performed. It's like 100 years old. And when you said silver points, it was so amazing because – it, with a silver point, people would say, well, why do you got to clean all this stuff? I got this little silver point. It looks like a little silver point. It's because they cleaned out the canal. They cleaned out the infection. I remember my uh, uh, endodontic teacher, who I think is the smartest guy I ever met in my life, Bambi Duro Ogentebi. He was from uh, Lagos, uh, Nigeria. Do you know him? Yeah, I know. We, yeah, we had to learn about all those guys. Ogentebi, of oh, course. Oh, my God. And um, he, he, he used to always say, Howard, if you find all the canals and you get them all cleaned out, you could fill them with bird shit as long as it was <laughs> sterile. And, um, and so that's the deal. So this 100-year-old root canal, they paid so attention to cleaning that uh, it was amazing. Let, let's cut that out. I'm sending it over to Rico right now. Ryan's sending it to you right now. It's the oldest root canal video ever. But um, okay. that's my present I'll to you. When's your birthday? My birthday is June 29th coming up. I'll be 21 again. Okay, well, I was the first one that gave you a birthday present this year. All right. I, 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 appreciate I, I beat everyone else. Um, That's right. So I, I want to start, Rico. Um, podcasters are millennials. Old dogs like me, I'm 55. I got grandchildren. I When I get on an airplane, I pull out my book. And when the guy next to me is reading a book, I don't have to ask him if he has grandchildren. It, it's, it's a given. Um, but the um, these millennials, so you're talking to a younger audience. And what scares me is they're coming out of school three, four hundred thousand dollars in debt, and the first thing they say is, "I hate endo. Uh, I only did one in school. We we had two kids that graduated from a dental school, four hundred thousand dollars in debt on a podcast. One had done zero root canals in school, and he's wow. already decided he hated them. And the other guy did one, and he decided he hated them. And I said, well, you know, you've come this far. You're four hundred thousand dollars in debt." I don't, I don't care if you hate dentistry or not. You're going to have to do dentistry because you came too far. What would you say to a kid who walks out of dental school and says, Rico, I hate endo. I just want to do bleaching, bonding, veneers. Right. So I would tell that kid, and, and I actually get a – I have a, a, a very um, awesome platform through the ADA called the ADA Success Speaker. So I actually get a chance to go and talk to the senior dentists before – I mean senior dental students before they graduate – and talk to them about things like this. And I tell them, look, dentistry is such a big field and there's so much things you can do. Find those things you love. You know, find those things you're passionate about and be very good at it. Because if you're not passionate about it, you're not going to be efficient and you're not going to be good at it. So why would you frustrate yourself on doing a molar root canal when you can be doing other things that you enjoy and that you'd be more profitable? 
There's nothing more frustrating than spending three hours trying to do a molar root canal and the patient still says, hey, you know what? This tooth is still hurting when you get done. You can't put a crown on it. So then what are you going to do? Explain to the patient, hey, you know what? I don't know what's going on. The root canal looks good. Let's just send it to the specialist. Then the patient's going to get frustrated. They got to spend more money again and then they got to get it redone. So to having said that, if you don't like doing root canals, that's okay. You, there are so many other things you can do in dentistry that can be more profitable and you can have fun and enjoy doing it. Now, having said that, if you got three hours set to your side and you have an anterior tooth, I'm not telling you to punt the endo. You know, if you got the time to do it, and there's something in your comfort zone, do it, you know, and make sure you explain everything to the patients and do it well. So um, it all depends on the individual, you know, what do you like? And not, and not only if you like it, get the right training. I teach at the dental school at Georgia. These kids can't do not one molar. They can't touch it, which I think is crazy. Now, again, I'm a volunteer <laughs> uh, professor there, so I don't have any, you know, a bark in the, in, the, in the fight when it comes down to all the political stuff that happened in the dental school. But I think it's crazy not to have a student to at least have an experience with the molar root canal, you know. So, you know, I, so, so to sum it up, I think that you need to do what you feel comfortable with, what you feel passionate about. If you like endo, make sure you invest and take CE courses, read articles that I put out, look at some of my daily short posts of the day, and it'll give you some insight, some information to help you be more comfortable and profitable. And if you don't love it, if you can like it and do it. If you hate endo, there are some, some um, dentists hate it. That's okay. That doesn't make you a terrible dentist. You know, send it to your local endodontist and let them take care of it. And I think you'll do great. You know, I wish you'd start your dental, dental Town is a message board form. So it's organized into 50 forms, you know, root canals, fillings, crowns. I wish you'd start a forum under endodontics, Rico's post today, because you're putting these on LinkedIn, which are amazing. But these millennial dental students aren't on LinkedIn as much as Dental Town. And your cases are so motivational. And I love your quotes, too, your motivational quotes. I don't know what I love more, your endo cases or your, your uh, motivational, inspirational quotes. They're always a good picker-upper. But I wish you'd start a thread on those because they are, they are truly amazing. I want to go back to implants. A lot of these kids come out of school, and they see a failed root canal, or they see a tooth with, peri with a bunch of periodontal disease around it. And then they tell you, well, you know, since implants have a 98% success rate, I think instead of retreating the root canal or treating the perio, we should just extract the tooth and place an implant. What, what, what do you think when you hear these kids say that implants have a 98% success rate? I think it's just straining a, a, a gnat, you know, out of, out of some milk. You know, I think that <laughs> they'll extrapolate, you know, one little point that someone says and, and void all the other parameters that talk about that 98%. I mean, there may be one study that was quoted that, but that might be over maybe a period of two years, four years. And it all depends on, the, it has to be the in, ideal environment. Was that patient a smoker? Were they on bisphosphonates? Are they on antidepressants? All those things play a factor in having an implant last five and 10 years. So, you know, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's a lot of misinformation out there. And the thing is, the public, they're getting more smart. The public, they're going online. They're looking up information. They're getting research and they're asking questions. And if you're not prepared to answer the question properly, or if you do something that's not in the proper guidelines, guess what? The attorneys are going to have a field day on them. And that's what happens. I did a podcast with an attorney here in Atlanta, and that's what we talked about. We talked about malpractice in dentistry. We talked about malpractice in endodontics. And some of those things did encounter upon teeth that could have been saved, teeth that were extracted that could have been retreated. The root canal could have been done. Crown lengthening could have been done. But it was taken out, implant was placed, and now the patient has issues with the implant. But guess what? You can't go back and put the natural tooth in once you get the implant in there. So the only other solution is another implant, you know, and, you know, and that could become a problem. So we want to make sure that, that we educate our new students and, and the new dentists that, you know, implants isn't the panacea. It is a great option if the tooth can't be saved, but implants will, you will be seeing a lot more complications in the future with the implants. Most of the stuff I read from the periodontist is that at five years, 20% of implants have periimplantitis. 
And at nine years, the studies are all over from 40 to 60% have periimplantitis. Exactly. I read that study also by the, um, the, the NIH published that as well um, with dentistry. And that's what they said. And periimplantitis is so difficult to treat. Once you get that, it's kind of like a downhill spiral. You can try to manage it as best you can, but ultimately you end up having to take the implant out, clean the site out, do a graft, and put another implant in there. And um, yeah, and that's the that's issue. And we know that the longer we live, people are living longer. We know the bone is changing, the bone's remodeling, you're getting on more medications. Um, one of the studies came out at University of Buffalo a few years ago showing that um, you know, antidepressants is one of the most prescribed drug in the United States now. And now it's linked to four times implant failure after 10 years. So guess what? People on all those antidepressants, they're going to have some issues with those implants. So all these things that are coming out, you know, we need to really look, look closely into them because, you know, we don't want the pendulum to shift. Well, it is going to shift just like it did when we talked about earlier talked about silver points, gutta percha, silver points, and now we're back to gutta percha again. So, um, you know, it's just one of those things we just have to educate. And I understand what you're saying. Going back to the original question, you know, these dental students, man, they got a hill to climb. I mean, you're talking about three, four hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt. I mean, my God, how are we going to serve it? But guess what? I tell them, I said, Rome wasn't built in a day. You know, you will get those things down once you, you know, establish a plan and you don't have to just go hard. I tried to do that. When I came out of endo pro, my endo program, I owed about $300,000 from dental school and my endo program. And I'm like, I'm trying to work six days a week. I got burnt out and I couldn't do it. And I just said, you know what? I'm just going to pace myself gradually, gradually, gradually. And, you know, I think it took me probably eight years and I was able to pay all that debt down and off. So it, it takes time. But, but, you know, you'll look up and it'll be gone. So, I tell them, don't stress out about it. You know, just keep hammering at it a little at a time, and then you'll get that paid. Uh, this is Dentistry Uncensored, so I don't want to talk about anything that everyone agrees on. Uh, when I got out of school 30 years ago, the media made us the bad guys because uh, people were dying of cancer and not given morphine and, and opioids, and people were having wisdom teeth taken out and not given um, Dilaudid and all these things like that. And we, we, we dentists and physicians and MDs were just too conservative and people were suffering. Oh my God, did the pendulum swing. Now we're the bad guys again because we prescribe opioids. And right. you do a molar root canal. We're just talking about root canals. You do a, a molar root canal and Frank's 60 years old and he's had three. He wants Vicodin and he calls it by name or, and, uh, and now these dentists are feeling like they're dirty if they give someone um, an opioid. Um, how do you just, uh, and I know the pencil is going to come back because, um, but anyway, what, what do you, if you did 100 molar root canals, what percent of them would get an opioid? Well, it, it all depends on the case. It all depends on, the, you know, what, if they came in a lot of pain, if they're swollen, if they've been abscessed, they've been up all night. So it all depends. It's a case by case basis. Now, the majority of the patients, to be, in my opinion, I would say 80 percent of them can be managed with over the counter pain medicine. Um, there's been some great studies that show if a patient can take ibuprofen and, and Tylenol, um, I typically give patients um, 600 milligrams of ibuprofen and one extra strength Tylenol, which is 500 milligrams of acetaminophen. Take that in combination <clears throat> before the anesthetic wears off after treatment. Most of them don't need to take anything else after that. It really gets on top of it. Some of the studies show it's just as effective as a narcotic without the side effects. They can go to work. They can presume normal activities. You don't really have to worry about them getting addicted to that or even having their kids go in their medicine cabinet and grab their opioids and, and abuse them. So I always use that as the first line of defense. So that's key. That's, that's numero uno. And there are some occasions I still would prescribe opioids as well, but I'll tell them, you know what, the opioids, when it comes down to the kind of work we do, it doesn't manage your pain as effectively as you may think. It almost acts as a central nervous system depressant and it kind of makes you forget about the pain versus the Tylenol and, and ibuprofen combo that actually actively manages the pain because it attacks the, 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 um, the anti-inflammatories that's triggered 
either before treatment or after treatment, and that really gives you the pain relief. So um, I actually have a couple of articles on that, and I, and I post that with the big opioid challenge that we're doing. I've been posting it. I mean, I've been talking about that now almost 10 years, um, and uh, people are starting to use it, and it's like, wow, this works better than the Tramadol and the Vicodin and all that kind of stuff. So, so that's what I would you know, definitely recommend that. When you're, what percent of your practice would you say is retreat versus initial treatment? I would say probably at least 80% of my practice is retreatment. Why? Because most <laughs> dentists are doing their own root canals. Why? Because go back to what we we're talking about. Most of them are trying to chop at that student loan debt, you know, and I don't blame them. Hey, you know what? Let's try. If it doesn't work out, you know what? Send to the endodontist. And um, statistically, 80 percent, according to the AAE um, in 2017, 80 percent of root canals are done by the journal dentist. What so, percent? What percent? 80. 80 percent. Yeah. OK. Um, our root canals are done by the general dentist. So as an endodontist, we only seen about 20 percent of them funnel in that haven't been touched. So. Now, if you're going to be a very good endodontist, you got to be very good at retreating or very good at doing surgery because that's what we're seeing most of the time now. And when you see 80% of your practice, you see a failed root canal. Why, why do they fail? Is it missed canal? Do they not get to the apex? You think they're just making it um, cleaning and shaping as far so it looks good on an x-ray? Well, what, why, why do you think they're failing? Uh, most of most of the failures I see are just like you just mentioned. Number one, miss canal, and number two, um, fail to get to the apex or failure to be able to clean out. As Seltzer and Bender, old school endodontist says, remove the critical mass of bacteria. Being able to clean, like you said before, we talked about back in the day. Why did these old root canals work that look like crap on the X-ray? Is because they spent two hours cleaning it out. They spent two hours letting bleach soak in there. They spent two hours hand filing. And, and, and that's why, because they spent more time cleaning it out. And one of the big failures that we're seeing now is because there are some endodontists that's making it easy. They're coming out with easy file systems. Step one, step two, step three, plug it. You know, hey, I can teach you to do a root canal, in, a molar root canal in 30 minutes. The problem is you're doing it too fast and you don't have enough time for the irrigants to work the irrigants to clean it out. And so sometimes we'll see beautiful root canals that are failing. The main root canals that I see that are failing that look great are thermophils. They look perfect on the x-ray. Patients are pain, swollen, hurting. Why? It's because it's a failure of cleaning and shaping. Why? Because the thermophil is a plastic carrier with gutta percha wrapped around it. You can jam that inside the canal, tissue can be everywhere, and it looks great on the x-ray. But guess what? You can't do traditional gutta percha like that. Why? Because it's going to crinkle on top. Once it hit that tissue or, the, or any pulp stones, it's going to crinkle and you can't get it down. So you can't, quote unquote, cheat as well with traditional gutta percha than you can with these thermophil and these carrier-based obturators. So as endodontists, we'll all tell you, we retreat more thermophils and carrier-based obturators than ever before. And it's not because the technique is terrible. You know, it's usually involved in not spending enough time cleaning and shaping and finding the canals. So do you, um, how long does it take you, when, when you're doing an initial treatment, a molar, first time, cario endo, um, how long does it take you? Well, again, it all depends on the case. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been doing it long enough where I don't cookie cut cases. Every case is unique. Every patient is unique. So it all depends on um, the situation. Does it have a large lesion on it? If I open it up, is it very hyperemic? If I open it up, is it draining pus everywhere? So it all depends on the case. But an average molar root canal for me, you know, I feel comfortable with doing it probably about 45 minutes to an hour to make sure we find all the canals, make sure we got everything um, cleaned and shaped properly. And then we're ready to obturate it. We can dry the canal. So on average, I like to spend about 45 minutes to an hour for a molar. Um, can I do it faster than that? I'm pretty sure I can. But is that going to be in the best interest of the patient long term? Probably not. 
So, and that's what we're after. We're after the best long-term success, not how fast we can do it or how much money we can produce. So that's what I always uh, preach or teach to my students and also to my online audience. And a lot of, um, a lot, lot of people wonder, what, what are you thinking when you decide to one step versus one appointment versus two appointment endo? When do you say we need to temporize this? Um, I think most endo can be done in one visit if you've A, found out the canals and B, cleaned and shaped properly and C, if you're able to dry the case. If you typically can do that, the studies show that there's no difference between one visit and two visits. Um, there are some cases, though, I have patients and they've been up all night, they've been hurting and they, they just been, you know, having a dog time with the tooth. A lot of those I don't like to do it in one visit. I like to do it in two visits. Not because I don't think one visit can work. I like to bring the patient back. How are you doing, Ms. Jones? How is the tooth feeling okay? I feel more comfortable being able to complete it when they are feeling better and they've been comfortable. If they've been up all night suffering, a lot of swelling. And then, you know, those are the cases I like to do in two visits to bring them back just to make sure you're doing okay, make sure we got everything cleaned out and, and give them a, a better chance at long-term success. When, you, when you're talking on that podcast uh, to the lawyer and lawsuits regarding endodontics, um, it seems like um, standard of care, a definition of standard of care is all over the place. I mean, if you ask 10 dentists what standard of care is, you're going to get 10 different answers. What do, right. you, what do the, you and the lawyers think is standard of care? Well, right now, there's only one universal standard of care in endodontics, and that's using the rubber dam. On every case, on every endo case, that is the standard of care. Um, that's what we have. That's what it is. Now, all these other things are kind of outliers. And that's all dependent on the judge and the jury. You know, what's the standard of care? It all depends on what falls in their hands. And, you know, we used to have something called the locality rule. What that means is that you have to do endo just as good as the endodontist. Um, in your area if you're a general dentist. Now that's kind of, you know, wiped off the book, so to speak, because you have the internet, you have access to information um, that you never really had before. If you were practicing in some part of West Virginia and you're the only dentist in 200 mile radius, well, guess what? You are that person for everybody, you know, and you wasn't at one point held to the same standard of care, but now, you know, you are. So, um, you know, most of the time, the standard of care lies in the hands of the lawyers um, and also the, the juror. Now, having said that, there are some things that people would say is the standard of care. That's really not. Number one, some endodontists would say a microscope is the standard of care, which is not. We use a microscope. It definitely helps us, but it doesn't necessarily say somebody using loops aren't as good as somebody who used a microscope. We, 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 there are some studies that have said that, but again, that's not a standard of care. Everything that kind of comes new through the pipeline, and that's the buzzword, kind of try to get wrapped with the label of standard of care. Cone beam CT. A lot of people are saying, oh, this is the new standard of care, but guess what? It's not as of yet. It might be in the future, but right now, two-dimensional x-rays are the standard of care it, it, on every case, especially you can't see in between teeth clinically. So um, the standard of care thing, um, people will drag it out, people will try to use it for their advantage to try to market things and all that. But really there's only one standard of care we have in endo and that's using the rubber dam, that's it. When you see cases uh, actually go to lawyers, what, 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 what stands out about those cases? What, what, do, you, what do you think is the difference in a root canal, a failed root canal? versus it went all the way to the lawyer? Usually, um, when I have to look at cases before it goes to the lawyer, usually it's incomplete documentation. The documentation is not complete. The documentation does not indicate that there's a rubber dam used. There's no x-ray that shows that a rubber dam was used. Um, and it's, and it's, it's a lot of things about documentation. And the other thing is communication with the patient. No informed consent. If you don't inform the patient of what you're doing and have them sign off on it, you know, that's a problem. So those are the main two things that I see is, you know, incomplete documentation um, and no, um, no rubber dam. Now, however, there are some cases in which I'm dealing with right now 
there's a um, case where a dentist, um, he likes to do root canals in Atlanta. He did a root canal and the case did not go well. Um, the patient found out about me and I told him he need to have it retreated. And it was a missed MB2, incompletely filled, uh, mesial buccal, short field palatal lesions on both roots. We retreated, we took care of it. Um, the dentist did not want to give the patient back his money. So the patient decided to sue him. So um, now there's a case in which um, it's, we're gonna see how far it's gonna go. Um, and it's not considered um, the standard of care but if this patient would not have gotten it retreated, they would have had problems out the tooth and pain and suffering would have ensued. So we're going to see how this case goes. Um, I always try to defend my dentists and try to make sure they don't have to go down that route to try to help them out. But of course, with anything else, there are some that just don't listen to the advice and they do it their way. So, um, so we're going to see how that one goes. Um, so, you know, um, so we, we see that come through. But at the end of the day, no one wants to be sued. I don't like to see any of my fellow colleagues in a courtroom trying to defend themselves on why they did a root canal the way they did it. I just can't understand not giving a refund. I mean, my gosh, I mean, it, it, just see, even if you didn't get sued, just if you went to the board, uh, they're going to have sleepless nights, they're going to have to cancel patients to go to the board, all this, all this crap. And then I look at Walmart. I mean, I, I'm I'm from Kansas, so you know I I wasn't born in uh, Beverly Hills or Key Biscayne, and in Kansas, uh, our Nordstroms is uh, has a different name. And uh, the Nordstroms in Kansas, they call them WalMarts, and WalMarts <laughs> returns seven percent of sales. You buy a toaster or anything at Walmart, and you say you don't like it, and you bring it back. Seven out of a hundred items are returned, and Walmart never questions you. They have a no questions asked return policy because the next time you're in their shopping, they don't want you worrying about the return policy. So they can return 7% and some dentists would, instead of refunding a denture or a root canal, uh, decides, no, I'm going to stand my ground. And now he's dealing with an attorney. How much will his attorney cost be? I mean, what, 10 root canals? I mean, it, it's just it's just crazy. And, and I think a lot of it, they get emotional about what's right and what's wrong. What do you mean what's right and what's wrong? People are crazy. You go to a Ferran family reunion, there should be the centers of disease control should be there doing DNA testing to see what went wrong with half the population. I mean, people are just crazy. And um, and I have um, I mean, I've refunded money on a denture. And he wouldn't even give me the denture back. Grandpa wanted a refund on my horrible denture, but wouldn't give it back. And I could see he was wearing it because I'm, you know, I mean, I saw, but I gave it back to him because the guy's going to live a mile from my office until he dies. And I don't want him walking around Safeway saying that guy's horrible. I mean, just, I mean, people are crazy. Refund the money. If Walmart could do 7%, I bet the average dentist in America doesn't even refund 1%. So if yeah. Walmart's doing seven percent, why can't a dentist? It's just ego and pride. Yeah, you know, and I, and I agree. And that there there are some cases that you know you can do the best you can. The patient's unhappy, you know. And I think that I agree with you. I think the best thing to do is to even if you don't refund all the money, just refund something just to, to show that hey, you know what? I, I I understand you know your issue. We may not agree, but. Here's something that that can try to help you out. Um, you know, they that's just how it is. I mean, I've refunded patients back money on things like that, even though I've done the best I, I could with the case. You know, but most of the time it boils down to, um, you know, unclear communication and unexpected um, you know, expectations not met. You know, um, and, and that happens. But, you know, like you said before, why in the world would you want to spend your time, your money away from your practice on attorney? That's something that costs you so much more. You know, just give the patient back their money and just move on with it. I mean, you got, you, you know, and because like you said, it's going to mess with your sleep. It's going to mess with your your spouse. You're going to kick your dog. You're going to just be a grumpy old man, old woman, whoever you are. You know, so it's not worth it. So just just try to do the right thing and just you know, and just move ahead, move on. Yeah, and, and the other thing, it, it takes your smile off your face. It makes them uh, 
stress. I mean, you have enough stress dealing with crazy patients, crazy staff, crazy insurance companies. Last thing you need to do is be shooting yourself in the foot uh, over a refund. But here, here's the consumer side. I want to talk about warranties because, you know, the average American between age 16 and 76 in 60 years will actually buy 13 new cars with the median average uh, price of that new car, 33500 So when they buy a car... The reason GMAC Finance will finance it is that they don't have to worry about the car lasting five years. They know that's not the risk. The risk is uh, what percent are going to default on the car. So then when they come in and get a root canal or they get any dentistry done, um, a lot of people just have that five-year thing in their head. Well, this didn't even last five years. And 30 years of listening to people, they throw that five around all the time because that's what they know from auto. And the, the biggest expense they'll have is their, car, is their house. Second is their car. Um, so when someone comes in and, and gets a Muller root canal from Rico, do you warranty at five years? How, how does your mind wrap around warranties? Well, I tell them like this. I said the only reason why they can um, give you a warranty is because those things are man-made. You know, and it's different than what we do. I mean, what we do, we're working on a human body. There's so many more factors that can go wrong that we can't fix because this is not man-made. You, you, we, you did not come with an instruction manual. No one didn't put you on an assembly line and put you together. So therefore, there are some things that is going to be out of our hands. And we do the best job we can in order for your body to accept the treatment that we do. And I tell people all the time, I can't make you heal. But I could put your body in the best position for it to heal itself. So statistically, how long does a a good root canal last? If it's restored properly, it can last you indefinitely, 95%. That's what I tell patients. Average, 95%. If it's restored properly, you'll have this indefinitely. Now, depending on the case, the percentages can go down. And but we're going to do our best to try to help you, you know, keep this tooth as long as possible. Um, when you're coming in for a root canal, you're not coming in for maintenance work. You're coming in as a last step in order to save your tooth. It's like you're coming in, you just had a heart attack. You're going into the cardiologist, the cardiothoracic surgeon. Hey, buddy, this is your last round. You know, we're going to do the best we can to get that heart going and keep you alive. But guess what? When it doesn't work, it's not that cardiologist's fault. It's not the fact that cardiologist or the cardiothoracic surgeon did something wrong. They did the best they could to get you more longevity out of your life. Guess what? The endodontist is not my fault that you have a big hole in your tooth, you know, that you didn't brush your tooth, that you're in a trauma. We're coming in to try to buy you some more time. That's what we're trying to do. You're past the maintenance phase when you come and see us. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's what we do. And when we put it like that, patients understand, wait, this is different. This is not something like Walmart that I need to, you know, that I need to get a, uh, a warranty, so to speak, on it. This is something that's different because I don't know not one patient that ever tried to sue their cardiologist or their cardiothoracic surgeon because they died because that surgeon was trying to help them. You know, and I put it that way and they say, wow, I didn't think about that. And I'm like, yeah, it's different. So I try, me personally, my practice, I try to remove the stigma of trying to attach what we do to what a Walmart does and what a Nordstrom does. And so when I spend that time with the patient, they say, oh, okay, you know, I get it. It is different. So that's what I try to do. You know, when, the, when I ask the insur- insurance companies don't like to share data, but I uh, was speaking in Florida to a group of uh, 200 uh, insurance people and they were showing me data, but they won't let me, they won't post on dental town and they won't give it to me. They're, they're very, um, I was talking to the ADA about that, how they really, I wish they'd really try to get more uh, data from Delta to release their numbers. But they, these, these big insurance were showing me that if a general measuring root canal failure by just the tooth was extracted, you know, crystal clear, no, you looking at and saying there's, periapical radiology or it's symptomatic and none of that just was the tooth pulled or not that when ended on us to a root canal at five years five percent of the teeth are extracted and when general dentists do the molar root canal at five years ten percent are extracted so as measured by extractions um 
Endo does have a 95% five-year survival rate. General Dennis is 90%. Um, when you're talking about um, back to standard of care, malpractice, warranties, is file separation um, partly the dentist's fault, the endodontist's fault? Is it the file company's fault? What are you, what are you thinking when you see file separation? I think it's multifactorial. You know, um, of course, the dental companies don't want to say, hey, you know what, this this file, we had a glitch in this file. We had a micro nick in it. And when you went around that curve, that's what caused it to separate. They're not going to be any dental company that's going to, you know, fess up to that. You know, so there are some manufacturer errors. There are some operator errors. There are some cases in which you pick the wrong file for that case. And all that comes with experience and and and. Um, getting more education on, you know, which files to use on certain cases. But guess what? A separated instrument is not um, practicing below the standard of care. It's not a breach of the standard of care. The key is that should be in your consent that endodontic instruments can file, can separate it inside the canal and the patient understand that. And number two, if that happens to you, you have to document that in the chart and tell the patient. If you've done all three of those, you're fine. Even if the, the, the um, separated canal caused, you know, let me back up. The file itself, as long as it's sterile, the file never causes the problem. I tell people, you're talking about a file that's three or four millimeters in length, maybe a half a millimeter, two in diameter, and you got a freaking knee implant that's titanium that's like, you know, you got 10 pounds of titanium in your knee, you know. You know, as long as it's sterile, it's okay. The problem is, is a lot of dentists go in there and they, the first thing they pick up is these rotary files and they go straight in there and they haven't cleaned the canal out well. So the bacteria beyond the file, that becomes a problem. It goes back to the bacteria not cleaning it out. And, but you look at the x-ray, you would think, oh man, there's a file in there and there's a big area of infection. Man, the separated file must be the cause of it. It's not. And a separated file is going to happen to all of us. It still happens to me. Even done, you know, 100,000 of better cases, it still happens. You know, but the key is if you've cleaned it out well with hand files, and I'm still an advocate, I'm still old school with that first. And then if you have a separated instrument, usually it doesn't even play a part in the success rate of the case. I tell the patient, hey, you know what? You just left with a parting gift. You left with something more expensive in your mouth than you had before, you know? And they, they laugh at all. I'm like, okay, just make sure it doesn't go off when I'm going through the airport security system. I said, no, it won't. So, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. You know, in most cases, it's fine. You just have to make sure that that's explained to the patient, make sure it's documented. If they do have an issue with it, send it to your local friendly in the Donist, and we can take care of it from there. How, how uh, far do you uh, work it up before you switch from hand file to rotary file? Well, in most cases, um, I like to have at least a 10 or a size 15 hand file to my working length at the apex. Once I've gotten that taken care of, I'm pretty secure in just about any file system that I choose to use on the case. Um, a lot of times with all this marketing going on, you know, it's, oh, you don't even have to use hand files to go straight to rotary. You know, if you do that, if you have a separated instrument, you're in trouble at that point. So when I teach, I always tell them, you know, get you a good glide path, at least a 10 or 15 um, hand file to the apex where it's safe. And then you introduce your rotaries. And if you do have a separate instrument, chances are you've already been down there. You've at least cleaned it out somewhat. Chances are the case will still be okay. I hope you honor us someday with putting an online CE course on Dentaltown. We put Absolutely. up... We put up 400 one-hour courses, all ADA approved, and uh, they, they're coming up on a million views in every single country on earth. Wow, incredible. Yeah, wow. it is amazing. Well, what is your go-to file system? Um, well, I still use a hybrid system. One of my favorite file systems um, is Edge System, the Edge file. Um, Dr. Goodis is a good friend of mine. and Out of um, Albuquerque. Yeah, Albuquerque. He's, I call him my brother from another mother. I, I, and I salute him for, you know, challenging all the big endo guys. And he's been a small guy and started from scratch. 
He has phenomenal products. I've tried them all, but my favorite is the Edge X7. It's a really nice universal heat treated file um, that's cost effective, strong, um, um, resilient, can go around curves, you can pre-bend it, um, no shape memory, so it doesn't typically straighten out in a case. So it's, it's, it's my go-to file on, on most cases. It's, it's half the cost of most of the other files out there, and, and I trust him. I mean, Dr. Goodis, um, he's, he's an endodontist, and also he's an engineer. I think you've had, I know you've had him on the show because I saw the podcast, which was great. Um, and, and he does a, a good job with the files. So, um, you know, and he's giving these other big endos hell. He's giving them hell. And they, I told him, I said, I talk with Dent Sply and I talk with Brassman. I talk with all those guys. I said, hey, you know what? If you're going to can be competitive, you guys going to have to get your prices down because if not, they're going to eat your lunch. I mean, that's just how it is. I mean, I'm not saying you guys have bad files. I think everybody has a nice file. You know, some people, what do you drive, Howard? What do you drive? A, a, a 2004 Lexus 450 with 150,000 miles on it. Okay. So <laughs> your Lexus is no different than someone driving a Subaru because it gets you where you need to go. It doesn't matter. And I tell people it doesn't matter your file system. You just like it and you get good at it and you know it. You know, I still have, you know, my 2004 BMW. <laughs> you know, I still, no, it's 2005. Ah, you know what? I, I won then. I'm, mine's a year older. I won. <laughs> you know? How many so, miles you got on it? 60,000. Only got 60,000 miles on it. Man, what do you live? Three blocks from work? No, the freaking thing stays in the shop so much. I don't I usually <laughs> scared to drive it. You crank it up. <laughs> so, uh, but guess what? I have, a, I have a 2007 Lexus. It has 125,000 miles on it, ES350. It never is in the shop, man. Right, right. It doesn't all the pizzazz it's a toyota for goodness sake it's what it is you know so um i tell people you know just find out what you got and you use it now there are some cases i'll i'll pull my bmw out you know nice night you know ain't raining uh, you know i use i pull it out but guess what most of the time i'll pull out my lexus because it's the tried and true and it's the same way with file systems i mean you're spending 25 dollars on a nice file system X7 Edge Endo, why the heck wouldn't you use it, <laughs> you know? And it has, you know, all the studies and all that kind of stuff talks about it. You could spend money on all this other fancy smancy stuff, you know, that you get big marketing and they take it over with marketing. But guess what? At the end of the day, we're going to get to the same place. Depends on how you want to get there. So, you know, that's just the, the bottom line on, you know, on that. Uh, Ryan's in the market for a new car, and I said, "Son, Japanese, Japanese." I mean, I, I when I bought my Lexus, I, I knew I'd get two hundred fifty thousand miles out of it. I just didn't know that uh, fourteen years later I'd still have a hundred thousand to go. But I mean, the the car hasn't blinked. I have no problem with it, um, right. and I, I don't even think people realize how damn old it is. It's just so trying true. I'm going to switch to the the um, uh, the pains. Uh, when, all the studies I've seen for thirty years. You can cut the um, American market in the half consistently for three decades. Half of the people are shopping on price uh, or, or fear of cost, and half are fear of pain. And um, uh, whether it be um, psychological pain, it's going to look ugly, whatever. But the, the big deal is the pain, the shot. And it's very, very emotional because they're so scared yet they're sleeved with a tattoo all the way in on their arm that had a million shots they have you know paper clips to their eyebrow a bar through their tongue you know their belly buttons pierced um you are in the worst of it because the most feared procedure is a root canal um how do you do you put people to sleep do you use laughing gas do you leave halcyon do you manage it with armchair psychology how do you deal with uh I mean, you have to know that at least half of your customers do not want to be having a root canal. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so, well, more than half, I would say. I, I, I would say nobody wants a root canal. You know, uh, don't, no one ever signed up and said, hey, I'm here because I love getting root canals. Now, they'll say that for ortho. Or obviously, you know, everybody wants to look, look pretty and nice and all that kind of stuff. But, but, but first, I, I start with just some general chair side, psychology, compassion, you know, getting getting um you know getting them to understand we're all on the same page we're here to help you and we we go through that i would say 90 percent of the time 
I don't have to do any other oral sedations, any halcyon or nitrous or any of that kind of stuff. Now, for the other 10 percent, we do have to do some type of sedation. Most of the time um, we use nitrous and there are some some situations that we have to use some volume and things like that. But most of the time it really boils down to that chair side manner, chair side psychology, talking them through the whole procedure, letting them feel that they are in control over the procedure. And that's very important. You know, um, hey, I'm going to do this. If you have any discomfort, raise your left hand. We'll stop immediately. We're going to take care of you. And once we get through that, and the key is, and what I teach is make sure you have profound anesthesia before you get going. And there are some techniques to that. If you have that and they have no pain, they are going to think you are God as an endodontist because they're going to say, wow, my feeling hurt worse than getting that root canal. And that's a great that's a great testament to what we do. And not only that, we'll get a good patient. This is what I encourage other, my other endo colleagues to do. And even my dentist, get them, give them to give you a patient testimonial, video t- testimony. Put it on the website. Put it on, you know, put it on your podcast. <laughs> you know, let people know that, hey, you know what? It doesn't have to hurt. And, you know, they'll, they'll see these things and that will you know, bring that fear down. In fact, we just came off Root Canal Awareness Week last week, and there was a national campaign that we talked about root canals are, don't cause pain, they prevent pain, and they get you out of pain, you know, all those kind of things. And now um, the fear of root canals amongst millennials are nil to none. Most millennials aren't scared of a root canal. It's the guys, you know, that's 50, 60, and above, they're like, oh my God, I gotta because they had bad experiences growing up as a kid at a dentist. You take most of the patients that's, you know, under 40, um, you know, and under, these guys aren't like, oh my God, I gotta get a root canal. They're like, all right, you just gotta do the root canal and just, you know, so I can do what I gotta do and they're done. So that, that it, I think it's a lot to do with that age gap where dentistry was one point, hell, terrible. But now a lot of these, you know, 40 and unders, millennials, it's not, they, they don't, you know, fear it like the, you know, the other age does. And are you using septicane or lidocaine? I use both. It all depends on the, on, on the situation. Um, I use, I, I like to use septicane on, on, on a hot lower molar infiltration. I don't like to do a block. Some of the studies saying block, blocking with it can cause some paresthesia and that's still kind of, up to debate. There are some studies that say, yes, it does. Some studies say it doesn't make a difference, but I always like to err on the side of caution. You know, why in, the, why in the world I want to give a block on something that could possibly cause that? Even if it was only one case out of 100,000, I don't want to be that one case. So, you know, I still block with my traditional xylocaine or lidocaine, and, and I'll do infiltration with the, with the septicane or articane if I need to. You know, a lot of a lot of times, they, uh, these kids are posting pictures on uh, Dental Town where they they were going to go in and do a root canal, but after they took out the MOD amalgam, they now see a black line down the bottom. What it, what goes through your mind when you remove the MOD amalgam and there's a black line down there? Um, usually, then if there's a black line, you know, obviously there's a crack. Um, it doesn't mean the tooth need to be extracted though. I mean, you have to look at the whole case. It could just be just a, just a crack that just stopped right at the pulpal floor. And if you don't have any other issues, like, you know, do you have a sinus tract present? Do you have significant probing? Do you have mobility? Do you have depressibility? And if the bone is solid around there, you know, I would definitely not think extraction. You know, you do the endo. Um, if you like for myself, I have a microscope. And as long as I don't see the crack going into the root canal system, I think the tooth has a good chance of lasting a long time. And I encourage the patient to, um, you know, try to keep the tooth, do the endo, restore it. And we hope long term that it'll last. Now, we do let them know that there's a crack there. We don't like a crack. Um, You know, the, the prognosis isn't as high as it normally would be if we didn't see it. But it definitely doesn't mean the tooth needs to come out and get an implant. What microscope do you have? What brand did you go with? Um, I use Global, a Global Microscope. Out of St. Uh, Louis? Out of St. Louis, that's right. Yep, Global, the old tried and true. So, uh, 
you know, I and, and I tell people all the time, again, it goes back to the whole car thing. You know, it doesn't matter what kind of microscope you use. You know, there's 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 people who are iPhone junkies. There are people who are smartphone. Guys. It doesn't matter. Both of them still can make a phone call. Both of them can still get on the Internet. Both of them still can do what you want them to do. You know, um, you have all these other companies, Zeiss, Siler, um, you know, the list goes on and on. Some of them have better optics than others. Some of them, the clarity is better than others. You know, even if you don't have a microscope, I mean, if you have the loops, if you have some high power loops with good magnification and illumination, you still can find what you need to find and get a great result. So, um, you know, I, I still have my global um, and I've had it for almost 20 years. It has not broken down, not one time. You know, I had to change the light source out because over a period of time it'll get dim and uh, you just keep moving. And how often do you have to use your microscope? If you did a hundred molars, when, what percent of the time, how many of those would you pull out your microscope? A hundred percent of them. Wow. I use them on every case, even if it's a number nine. And the reason is because there are certain things that we'll be able to see in the microscope. It may just be something small, like a little piece of tissue tag that you wouldn't be able to see otherwise. So, um, you know, I use a microscope on every single case 100% of the time. Wow. So tell us about being an ADA spokesperson and you're uh, an ADA success speaker. Tell us about your journey there. How did that come along? What well, that, that like? Well, well, that came along, and I'm just going to be frank with you. Um, I've tried to get involved in organized dentistry in my area for years, and, and, uh, you know, and I'm in the South, um, I'm from the South, so I know how sometimes things can work in the South when you are, are a minority, you know, and you are in a certain uh, um, area. Um, and I just got sick and tired of having to keep asking and no one giving me an opportunity. So I actually wrote the ADA and I said, hey, I've been doing this a long time. I think I contribute a lot to dentistry and I just can't get my foot in the door in my area in organized dentistry. And they said, OK, well, have you ever heard of a program called the ADA Diversity and Leadership? I said, no. They said, apply for it. So I applied once, did not get in. Applied twice, did not get in. The third time they said, apply again. I said, no, this is the same BS that I deal with at, in Georgia. I'm not going to apply again. They said, just try it one more time. So I applied and got in. So when I got into the program, um, it opened a lot of doors for me. The people got to know me that I normally wouldn't otherwise get a chance to rub shoulders with. And they say, hey, you know what? This guy, he has something to offer, you know, our profession as far from a leadership standpoint. And I started to um, do some projects with them and start volunteering at the ADA on a national level. Um, they sent word to my local organization, say, hey, you need to be giving this guy an opportunity and they talked to somebody, they talked to somebody, and, and all of a sudden, I got opportunities to do a lot of different things. Um, being able to be an ADA, um, I spoke at the ADA national meeting in Denver a couple of years ago as a new speaker. I did well. Um, they said, where in the hell have you been? I said, hey, I can't go anywhere if no one gives me an opportunity, and I don't want to sign with a company for them to put me up in lights for them to, so I have, they pay me to say certain things. I want to be independent. And I did well. And I got invited to the ADA when he was here in Atlanta and I spoke here. And since then, you know, it just catapulted me for a, a lot of other opportunities um, through uh, the ADA diversity and leadership program. And I'm a sounding board for the board of trustees. And I tell them some of the issues that other minority dentists have and some of the frank, you know, they're afraid. I mean, if I walk into a room, I'm a young dentist and I see someone like you, Howard, and everybody's like you, no one's talking to me. I mean, what the hell am I supposed to do? You know, I'm, I'm not going to feel comfortable. So if I don't feel comfortable, I don't feel welcome. I'm not going to come back. So and then they say, hey, okay, where is the diversity? Well, if you don't make people feel comfortable, there will not be diversity in leadership or in dentistry. So you have to be intentional. So. Um, there were some people, you know, James Crawley, the president of ADA, and I spoke to him about it and was like, hey, we, we need you here to be a sounding board. So through that, I've been uh, had uh, other opportunities to be um, an ADA spokesperson in endodontics. And again, you have to apply for these positions, go through an interview process. And um, the spokesperson position is dealing with endo if there's a crisis or they need a, a, an expert, the ADA need an expert to talk about you know, root canals causing cancer or, you know, this root canal causing my liver to fail. 
I'm the person they call if CNN needs to interview someone or national radio, NPR, anybody needs somebody. So I'm the guy that they call in that particular area. So it's just, you know, it's just giving me a lot of opportunities to network and to make us stronger together, you know, as, as, as diversity, um, diversified dentists all over, not only the United States, but all over the world. So, um, I, you know, and, and I was one of those guys, Howard, that I paid my dues since 1999 as an ADA member, even though I didn't feel like at the time I really got anything in return, but I felt like that was just the right thing to do. And I'm just now getting involved as of probably three or four years ago. Um, you know, and it's, it's just been a very awesome journey and I'm able to pull other people through that have a desire to get involved in organized dentistry and leadership, but they're afraid, you know, and they don't feel like they have things in common with, with you know, w- with other people. So, um, so it's just been an awesome, awesome journey so far. When I was at dental school, in uh, 1984, the, the head of the oral surgery is Brett Ferguson, an African-American who's now the president of the American Association of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery, yeah. AAMOS. And one day, we were talking about prescriptions oh, or something. Howard. Yeah. Howard. Not, not Butch Ferguson. Brett Ferguson. He's, he, where is he now? Brett Ferguson? Yes. Where does he practice? Um, Ca- Do you know? Ca- Kansas City. Kansas City, okay, because I know a guy, uh, he's an oral surgeon, he's in Augusta, he teaches in Augusta, his name is Butch Ferguson, so he's the head of that program, so I'm like, wait a minute, is this the same guy? But go ahead. But yeah, it's Brett Ferguson, and, um, and anyway, we were talking one day, an oral surgeon, and I said, uh, I said, Dr. Ferguson, I said, you are so damn smart, I said, he, I said do you, how do you keep all this in your head? I mean, you, you don't even look at the pharmaceutical, and he goes, are you kidding me, Howard? He goes, I'm an African-American. I got into the, I, I'm the chairman of the department. I couldn't make a B ever. I, I had to be straight A. I couldn't even get an A minus. He goes, year after, he, he says, a white kid like you, you could have got in with a three, two. But me, I had to be perfect to get in here. And then the other oral surgeon was African-American and, and UMKC, Charlie White, said the same thing. In Endo, we talked about Bambi Dura Ogantebi uh, mm-hmm. from Lagos, Nigeria. And the hurdles um, that they had to pass. And I, when I saw him become the president of AAMOS, I actually got verklempt. I mean, it was, it made me cry. I mean, I couldn't believe yeah. the journey. I'm, I mean, you know, it had to be a long, long road. Um, so um, we need to get you a course on Dental Town and get your beautiful face on the cover of Dental Town magazine. Uh, I, I would uh, love that. Um, I can't believe we already went over an hour. God, we, we've been babbling eight minutes past overtime. Our brand's an hour, and we already went eight minutes after. I could talk to you 40 days, 40 nights, but I want you to, you can't go without talking about uh, your book, Getting to the Root of Your Problem uh, on Amazon. Uh, tell us about your journey. What made you write that book? Tell, tell, tell them about the book, Getting to the Root of Your Problem, and it's actually not have anything to do with root canals, and microscopes and getting to the apex. What is getting to the root of your problem? 365 days of inspirational thinking, all five-star reviews on Amazon. Tell us about your journey. Why did you write that book? Well, I, I wrote the book because I realized that, you know, in life, we all have problems. We all deal with problems. Are you talking about and, Ryan? Yeah, just, yeah, it was Ryan. Yeah, yeah that's, that's <laughs> my only problem. Everything else so, is uh, uh, You know, so, so, you know, a lot of times, you know, people don't know how to deal with certain problems. And a lot of times, you know, some people say, you know, if you go to church, just open your Bible and read it. Well, the Bible can be very confusing and it can be very overwhelming for someone just to open it up and read it. So I say, you know, I'm going to take little bits and pieces of things from my life, from the Bible, from other philosophers like Socrates and Plato and put just a daily inspirational read, something that will encourage you in the beginning of the day and get you through the day. And um, it was birthed out of me posting uh, daily inspiration on Facebook. And someone said, hey, you know what? You need to have a book because all these things that you're posting, you know, we might not know all the root canal stuff, but the stuff about life, it is making a difference. And I'm like, yeah, whatever, making a difference. And I ended up getting a, a lady end up inboxing me and said, because of something you said today, I did not commit suicide. 
I had a gun to my head, but something you posted that encouraged me to let it go, give another day, tomorrow will be better. And she lived because it was something that I posted. And when she said that, it sent chills down my spine. I'm like, man, you know, I'm a little, you know, poor black kid from Columbus, Georgia, and I had the ability to keep somebody from committing suicide. You know, I must have some type of gift inside of me that I need to share with the world. And that's when I started writing the book. And I wanted to leave something for my kids also. I have two kids, they're 10 and 12 now, so they can know how their dad thought and how they processed. And it's not about all the accolades and the house you live in and the car you drive. It's about the difference that you're making in the lives of other people. Same thing about what you're doing, the difference that you're making in the lives of other people, Howard. When you, you know, sacrificing your time and your talent, you building this thing that some people probably told you that this is not going to work. You're wasting your time. This is going to cost you all these things. And you're taking time and you're sowing in the lives of people all over the world that's making a huge difference. And when you're gone, your legacy is still going to be ringing out to the hearts of people all over the world. And people will be thanking you for what you've done, contribute to dentistry and also contributing to their to their personal lives as well. And so I said, I want to make a small impact right now with that book. And that book hopefully would catapult me to be even a bigger influence in other people's lives. And it has It's opened the doors for me to do a lot of radio um, um, interviews and televisions. I got a chance to speak at TBN over 80 million viewers all over the world. Um, about my faith walk and how I got to where I am and just using dentistry as a platform. Howard, I'm going to tell you, I believe that dentistry for us is just a platform to touch the lives of people, to heal people, to make people have a better today and hopefully have a better tomorrow. And that's what it's all about. God has given us a gift of healing, a gift to be able to use our hands to touch people, to make them feel better. He's given you a gift of communication. I always kid with you. I said, you know, you're you're Howard Farron, but you're the Howard Stern of, of, of dentistry. <laughs> I love it because you're honest and, um, and you don't care about what other people think and what their opinions are. And I think that's beautiful. So, um, so that's what I want to do. And hopefully, you know, um, you don't know this, but you're a mentor of mine. I, I watch you from afar and I appreciate everything that you're doing, you know, in dentistry and, and putting those podcasts out there. Well, thanks, man. Same thing. We we should start a, a mutual admiration club. We'll be the <laughs> we'll be the only two members. Final question. Final question. At when uh, the Falcons are playing the Patriots in the Super Bowl at the halftime at twenty eight to three, did you absolutely? Would you have bet both of your cars you were going to win? Were you already celebrating? Did you already have the TV turned off? And then did that instantly go to one of the lowest points in your life? You, I, I would have gave away all four of my cars, man. I thought we had. I was like, man, we got it. We just got to hold on. We just got to hold on. And then when I start seeing, you know, we started sweating a little bit, and I looked in Tom Brady's eyes, and he saw some blood. I'm like, oh, shit. You know, we are in trouble. And when they start climbing back, it was about three minutes left in the game. I turned the TV off because I pretty much knew what was going to happen. I turned the TV off. I tried to sleep. I could not sleep. I went upstairs and closed the door, turned all the lights off, and I told my wife, please don't come in here and tell me. Even if we win, I don't want to know because it should not have been that close. Well, three well, o'clock in the morning, she broke the news, and I was just hurt. I mean, it felt like somebody ripped my heart out and stomped it on the ground. And I just like, this, this can't be happening. So, you know... Having said that, I still ended up buying a PSL. I still ended up <laughs> going into the new stadium with my hope still alive that this is going to be the year. The Super Bowl is in Atlanta. This is our redemption year. We're going to hoist that thing up in our own stadium at Mercedes-Benz Dome, and it's going to make everything a lot better. So that's where my faith is now. So we'll see. Well, we, we share the same pain. Uh, I'll never forget me and my mom. It was in 2009. The Arizona Cardinals were beating the Steelers with one minute left. And then that Ben Rossenchild throws a Hail Mary pass. And that yeah. guy, ca- I mean, our street was screaming. My mom, she lost her voice. I mean, we won. We had one minute. They were backed up. There's no way they could win. And if that son of a gun didn't throw 
a bomb. The guy caught it, ran right down the line. The whole street was just silent for probably about a week. That was yeah. tough. And so we lost at 27, 23. So I, I felt your pain during that deal. But hey, and not, um, and not only that, Howard, not only that, guess what? We same thing happened with Georgia in the dog <laughs> national championship with Alabama. It was the same story. We had it. <laughs> so I don't know. We, we, you know, Hey, the Braves are in first place now. So, you know, we'll see how long that's going to last. And we just have to, you know, enjoy the moment, <laughs> I guess. Cause at the end of the day, the big game, who knows, you know? Well, hey, I'm your biggest fan. Love your cases on LinkedIn. Thank you. My gosh. Uh, um, I hope someday you start uh, your own Rico thread on uh, endodontics on dental town and repost them there. They're amazing. I'm your biggest fan. I was so excited today to know that I got to wake up and uh, podcast interview you. Thank you so much for coming on the show today and talking to my homies. I hope you have a rocking hot day. Hey, thank you. My pleasure. Have a, have a blessed day.